And our next speaker is going to take us not to another task force, but to the accomplishment of tasks that are currently in play in New York State. And I'm speaking, of course, of Greg Olson, who's the director of the New York State Office of Aging. And he oversees the operation and administration of that agency, which assists over millions of older adults and offers programs to support families and caregivers. Greg has been there many been here many times before. He was actually Assemblyman Engelbright's legislative uh, person when we did the Compact for Long-Term Care several years ago. Greg, many years ago, perhaps. And today he's going to give us an update on what really one of the bright spots that we see, and that is the expansion of services through the New York State Office for Aging. We're hopeful that Adam Herbst can join us as well. Adam is on a call at the governor's office currently. If he frees up, he will be joining us. And Greg and Mark Kissinger in years past have co-presented from the New York State DOH and NISOFA perspectives. Adam is, for those of you that don't know, Adam is Mark's replacement. Mark has retired. And so he hopefully can join us to give us that DOH perspective as well. And with that, I want to welcome my good friend, Greg Olson. Greg, welcome to the program and take it away. Great, thank you so much, Lou. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes. Wonderful, well, I appreciate that introduction and I wanna thank you and Beth and Bruce and Aaron and everybody from Pierre O'Connor and Strauss. You know, 26 years of doing these amazing programs I think are really, really important. Senator Gillibrand's uh, opening remarks, at least for where we sit, um, were incredibly important. She has been a staunch supporter of not only my agency, but the, uh, the network that I'm honored to be able to, uh, to oversee. And certainly Senator Serino and Assemblyman McDonald for all their support over the years as well. And I really, uh, again, wanna thank our partnership with uh, not only you, but uh, with Beth Finkel and all the team at AARP. Um, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about, and I'm gonna give you some data um, there's 409 people who are tuned into this, some of them uh, from our network, um, but others of you who are working in other areas. And, you know, as we've been go going through this pandemic for the last 14 months, I think what we've learned uh, are a, a lot of things. Um, but the most important is probably the, uh, the need to cross train each other in terms of what our, all of our assets are and what we do and continuing to connect the dots and build partnerships. So for all of you out there, this has been an unbelievable 14 months. There's no question about that. Um, I wanna thank one of my primary partners, uh, Becky Preeby, who's the executive director of the association that represents the 59 counties, all of our county offices for the aging and our 1200 community-based partners, uh, all the new partners, um, both within state government, county government, and the private sector that we've been working with. Um, because I think what the aging network has been able to accomplish is really to demonstrate the value of what we do and the investments that have come to New York State and the country, uh, you know, from Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand and, and Congress, I think really demonstrated that value. So the future of, of aging in a COVID environment and a post-COVID environment is to build a real continuum one that's not reactive, which waits for people to be in a crisis, which waits for people to be so sick that they have to spend down and go into higher levels of care and to put our money kind of where our mouth is, no different than the public health sector where we spend very, very little amounts of money on the prevention side and all of the, uh, the dollars on the reactive side. Um, and I think we can do a lot better. So we're about rebuilding, um, building the partnerships that we've established or strengthening those uh, continuing to be innovative, continuing to have the flexibility to meet needs locally without a heavy hand coming from the top, uh, continuing to recognize the value not only of the population, and I'll get to that in a second, of older people, um, but also the value of what this network does and the data that we're able to provide on the return on investment for what we're able to do, um, and then addressing social determinants of health, which is what we do so well. So, you know, one of the earlier speakers mentioned and gave some demographics on um, aging and the growth of the aging population and how negative that is. I reject that premise. Uh, that is not true. Um, what we have is a, is a uh, con construct going back to 1965 that, again, incentivizes the most expensive uh, care in the least restrictive environment at the expense of those things that can be provided in the community very effectively and very cost effectively.
correctly um, and balance those types of things out. So, you know, the majority of older adults are healthy, uh, consider themselves very healthy or healthy. And when you work in this field, and we all do, you know, sometimes we're almost our worst enemies because the people that we see are those who have very complex uh, health and physical issues that may have dementia or some type of cognitive impairment, but that's not who this population is on mass. And so I think we got to make sure that we're not stuck in our 200 plus years of ageism ourselves and recognize that there is a much bigger picture and that all pieces of this from skilled care to community care matters. Um, again, on behalf of my partner, Adam, I'm not sure if he's gonna be able to be on. So if he is, I will cut mine down. I have way more information than I'm gonna be able to provide, but uh, Lou and his team do a great job of posting this and I wanted to make sure that you have uh, the data. So first, what is Aging Network in New York State? And why do I have to go over this? Because we talk to health systems weekly uh, since the outbreak of COVID and, and did a lot of work prior to with physicians offices and others. And they're really just, uh, I think that there's a myth in terms of what it is that we do. We're trips, we're bingo, we're home delivered meals. Certainly those are things that we do, but that is not even close or remotely close uh, to the services we provide, how we provide them, who we provide them to, what the cost is to provide them, what the outcomes are, what the return on investment is. So we traditionally serve four large groups of individuals. Uh, help the older adults that just might need some information, understand what their benefits may be, connect them to other resources if they're a veteran, for example, um, help them with their uh, insurance issues or prescription drugs. We put almost $100 million in people's pockets last year who are eligible, for example, for the low-income subsidy or the Medicare savings program. Volunteers, we have a million volunteers over the age of 55 in New York providing half a billion hours of service a year at an economic value of 13.8 billion. And then of course, older people are still a major part of the workforce. We deal with individuals with chronic conditions. Many times that's why people are going into acute care, the emergency room, or wind up being hospitalized or in a nursing home. Those are things that are preventable and manageable. Our network implements the highest level evidence-based interventions. I mandated that in 2014. Uh, 41 of them, things like chronic disease self-management, diabetes self-management, fall and injury prevention. And we're gonna to continue to work to expand those things with our healthcare partners. Um, our biggest book of business are those that are imminent risk of Medicaid spend down and higher levels of care. Goes back to what I said, the first line of defense is not skilled care in nursing homes. That should be the last line of defense. All of the, uh, the network of providers, whether they're clinical or not, are important. But the first line of defense shouldn't be the back end um, that's the most expensive when you can provide care in the community. And when you see who we actually provide services to, I think you're going to be shocked because the people that we provide services to are actually older, sicker, and frailer uh, than people on community Medicaid. And then as Beth mentioned, and uh, AARP has been a tremendous partner in addressing any, any time in one year, we have uh, over 4 million caregivers that's spouses, adult children, grandchildren, people of all ages that has a huge economic uh, impact if you take that away. So how can we support uh, caregivers uh, in this environment who provide the bulk of follow-up healthcare, who provide the bulk of long-term services and supports um, and are a major part of, of the family infrastructure. So again, this is what uh, Medicare and Medicaid focus on the high utilizers, most expensive individuals. And those are individuals with chronic conditions and functional limitations. Those are our core customers. And again, the folks that we serve um, are, have a higher need than the top five or the top 20% of spenders. And if you can see what the top needs identified by CMS are that they now allow Medicare Advantage plans, et cetera, to address social determinants, are the things that our network do every single day in every community around New York State. Home delivered meals, personal care, transportation, uh, chronic disease self-management. So if you look at our traditional customer, it's about an 82 year old female who lives alone, is low income, has two or more ADL limitations, upwards of six IADL limitations. Uh, and we're able to uh, assist with our package of services our uh, county connections and our community-based organization connections to serve these individuals for three to seven years in their homes. 
um, at a cost of under $10,000 a year. So when I go back to what's the future look like, Senator Gillibrand and Beth hit it right on the head. It's to put our money where our mouth is and develop a real continuum that is proactive, not reactive, and provides us the tools to do our jobs. And I'm, I'm really excited about many of the stimulus bills that gave us that ability to do that, but there's a lot more to be done and I'll get into that in a second. Um, these are just, again, the types of things that uh, we're providing. So, you know, we, we use acronyms and I hate acronyms. So uh, we use caregivers. Well, these are people that are providing uh, a variety of services for their loved ones. We talk about ADL and IADL, uh, et cetera. What we're dealing with is people that need assistance or total assistance in getting up in the morning, bathing, dressing, transferring, eating, uh, paying their bills, shopping, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And those things, again, can be done in the home and community. So what are the network strengths? We've been around, you know, Lou mentioned at the beginning, Medicare and Medicaid passed in 65. Uh, things have changed and evolved immensely over that time. Well, we, we were also, our mothership, the Older Americans Act was passed at the same time for a purpose, uh, to have a strong community-based infrastructure to prevent hospitalizations, emergency uh, room visits and nursing home placement, and to make sure that when people come out of those types of facilities with a, with a care plan, that they have a community network that can provide those types of services, because that's really the heavy lift. The acute care system is just that. It's episodic, it's acute, and then people go home. And then who's there to help make sure that uh, they have their medications, that they uh, have assistance uh, if they have a nutrition issue, get connected to community services, can get to their primary care physician or follow up at, at a specialist. That's what we do. Um, and so we spend a lot of time doing these types of things. So these are what our strengths are. We do not sell a product. What we sell is objective information. We, we sell uh, choice and we sell a comprehensive person-centered approach that assesses assets and strengths and then tries to work with an individual and their family if they have one uh, to meet those needs where they wanna be uh, which as Beth said, 90% of people um, want to remain in their home and just think of yourself. It's of course what I want to do as well. So this isn't a us, them, or those older people. Uh, this is going to be me, sorry about my dog, in 30 years. So this is a list of services that we provide in every community across New York State. Henry, sorry about that. Uh, Meals, nutrition counseling, senior center program, we have legal services, respite, caregiver supports, PC one and two, on and on and on, social adult day services, uh, and, and so forth. Um, so these are the things that are core in every single county across New York State and our 1,200 community-based partners. Uh, chronic conditions, we've talked about that. Again, this is going to cost almost a trillion dollars over the next 20 years. And these are things that are the most costly, disabling, and difficult to treat. They're also the most preventable and manageable. And so again, it's our business model that we've been living under for the last 40 years. That's the problem, not getting older. And again, I reject the ageism um, you know, that, that we as a country and as a culture have had to grow up in and live with, uh, that older adults are all old and frail, have dementia, and need nursing home placement. That's just not the facts. Uh, this is a sample of our customers, almost, um, you know, 75% in our core services have uh, four or more chronic conditions, and many have six or more chronic conditions, yet again, they can be uh, served and supported in their homes and communities and are every single day. These are the types of chronic conditions they have, heart disease, uh, diabetes, arthritis, cancer, et cetera which is why we implement 41 of the highest level evidence-based interventions uh, to help address and manage um, chronic conditions. We have a, we're a very small agency with a very large community footprint. We have 59 county-based area agencies on aging. We have almost 1,200 contractors, community-based organizations, social services, tons of different partnerships, and all of this is required by law, which is why we're structured this way. We have a, a really large group of congregate sites, meal sites, central kitchens, home delivered meal routes, uh, volunteers as uh, Beth had talked about are critical. And you know, during the pandemic, we were very concerned about capacity. 
Are we going to lose capacity because many of our volunteers who are providing direct services are older? Uh, and the fact is uh, that didn't happen. And not only did we not lose a lot of volunteers, um, and these were the ones who are most at risk of getting COVID and dying, but the community support, whether it be the Girl Scouts or uh, high school and college kids, um, uh, state workers and county workers that were deemed non-essential and, and others really stepped to the plate to, uh, to help expand service because we saw about a 100% increase in demand uh, for a variety of services. Um, we, we implement a very, very comprehensive assessment. It rivals the UAS minus the clinical data. But think if you are a uh, clinical provider, you're a hospital discharge planner, you're a physician, and you have access to this type of, of data, which is why we're working um, at the state level on electronic health records and, and, and Shiny and the, and the e-collaboratives, because these are things that we assess for that are very, very valuable. Uh, a couple of things that we've added in the last year is a tech check to make sure uh, and to understand what people can uh, do or not do with technology. Do they have broadband? Can we teach them how to use it? Can we teach a caregiver how to use it? As well as implementing uh, an isolation scale, but we screen for anxiety, depression, alcohol and substance abuse, uh, what programs and services they're receiving, what other uh, connections we could make like uh, with veterans agencies, um, and so on and so forth. And again, all of these uh, will be available to you. So I apologize about the speed. Um, some of the examples of where we fit in, uh, again, on the front end is helping with successful discharge planning, uh, diverting emergency room visits, redu reductions in social admissions, helping with patient satisfaction and HEDA scores, and then community interventions to address the social determinants of health, which we know are the main factor in healthcare costs. Um, not the, uh, the, the clinical diagnosis. Um, this allows for support in the community. Again, very large community footprint uh, with many, many partnerships. These are very low cost, high yield services. They're non-clinical. You don't need a doctor's note to receive the services. Um, we were able to intervene earlier at a much lower cost, serve people longer to keep them out of higher levels of care and ultimately spending down. Now, can we do that for everybody? Of course not but we can do that for very, uh, a lot of people. And then ongoing support to enhance and wrap services around medical interventions. So that's kind of the lay of the land and the context. And so what have we been up to since COVID? You know, we've all been dealing with this, how politicized and ridiculously uninformed people are depending on where they get their news, uh, whether it be on te television or social media or who you're listening to. Um, and so we've spent a lot of time in this network providing honest fact-based information and metrics led by the governor every day who uh, got up in front of folks and, and told them the truth. Uh, we implemented a COVID-19 checkup. The governor talked every day about our responsibility to each other, keeping ourselves safe so we keep our families safe, our communities safe. And we implemented the only tool in the country that actually assesses your own risk for not only getting COVID, but for being hospitalized, dying from COVID uh, and spreading COVID and provided real data on how you can uh, make adjustments to what you do every day uh, to do those types of things. It also had a mental health check uh, as well as an unmet need check so we could direct people to local resources. Our network was critical in the vaccination effort. First, to help make appointments, uh, to get the paperwork, uh, to get people to these appointments, providing transportation, et cetera, and then working with the health department and the governor's office, uh, a major effort uh, to expand and develop our in-home vaccination uh, program and partnerships. Apologize uh, about the spelling uh, error that's on me. The primary services that we saw in addition to all of those things that you saw earlier uh, were obviously home delivered meals. We already have the largest nutrition program in the country. Uh, we've served about 37 million meals uh, since March. Grocery and supply deliveries, people didn't want to go out, and rightly so, to stay safe, so we had to do those things. Medication deliveries, transportation to things you just that the pandemic doesn't stop. Dialysis, cancer treatments, combating social isolation. This was work that we began in 2018. Obviously, the pandemic made that worse, not only for older adults, but really for everybody. So our partnerships with uh, the Office of Mental Health other community-based providers uh, to really uh, not only develop technological solutions, 
but old school ways of reaching out, making phone calls, um, you know, connecting people in traditional methods. And then elder abuse and scams were um, obviously increased with that isolation and trying to protect people and their assets uh, from those scams. The best of people come out in situations like this and so do the worst. We received amazing flexibility both at the federal level and through Governor Cuomo's executive order. Uh, we were deemed essential workers, but it allowed us to use the dollars that we get. And we're not just a state funded network. We're not just a federal funded network. We are a federal, state, local funded network. And we get funding directly from the clients that we serve in the tune of about 35 million additional dollars. To be able to be innovative, flexible, adjust our business model very, very quickly uh, so that we can continue to provide services. And we're still under those uh, flexibility orders, which has been great. Uh, we've had to change our business model, like many of you have, to, to remote, and that's supposed to say where practical. Um, we uh, distributed over 1.87 million um, PPE and masks to the AAAs for people over 70, delivered more than 3,200 cases of hand sanitizer to the network, addressed social isolation in many, many different ways, working with our partners at Health and OMH, certainly all the innovative and organic things that have happened at the local level because we had that flexibility and the network that I work with understood that we had their back and they could be innovative. They could do things differently. Job number one was to serve people. So these are just some of the current projects and innovations that we have launched over the past few months. Again, partnership growth has been amazing. We can't just rely on uh, the federal government or the state with budget deficits to provide money. We have to develop and strengthen and show the efficacy of what we do so that we can get our partners to work with us, to invest with us because we both have the same goal uh, uh, in mind. So we have a lot of partnerships with the health systems. I'll mention a couple of them, the Care Compassionate Network in Southern Tier, uh, Emblem in New York City, Northwell, um, Excellus. So I really want to thank um, um, Haney's and, and Dora, as well as Charlie Williams at the health department, because we have been in the ground floor with the age-friendly health systems and providing um, education on what it is that we do. And that has led to um, some follow-ups and some partnerships. And those things are going to continue because, again, things that we're able to do, we do well. There's things that we're not able to do, but that's for others to do. And, I, and this is an opportunity for a real continuum where the clinical system and the social determinant system can really do some good work together. Many of you may or may not know Executive Order 190. Uh, we became the first age-friendly state in the nation um, as recognized by AARP and the World Health Organization. The governor passed Executive Order 190, which built a lot of livable community age-friendly concepts into uh, state government planning and uh, procurement opportunities so that we are building communities that support people across the age spectrum in a lot of areas so that we can grow up and grow old successfully. We funded an initial set of pilots to um, not only get uh, counties to wanna go through the, uh, the process of becoming an age-friendly community themselves, but also replicating Executive Order 190 at the county level. We're gonna be putting out another um, set of grants to replicate the executive order at the county level. Why is that important? because we can do little projects or work with counties to do things at a, at a micro level. But when you systematize things and build it into how uh, things work, um, you're able to make much more uh, important changes. I know I got a few uh, uh, minutes left. We are supporting the village movement, Neighbors Helping Neighbors. Again, have a, has a huge impact on supporting caregivers and providing those types of services that make a difference as well as home share. Uh, we're replicating uh, the very successful Home Share Vermont program in two counties in the state. We've partnered with a transportation provider called GoGo -Go Grandparent that is trained in the unique needs of older adults. Uh, we're expanding that across the state, but more importantly, it also provides an economic opportunity for older adults to become drivers to their peers. Uh, as Beth mentioned, we've received a $53 million investment over the last couple of years because we were able to show Medicaid savings uh, by providing our services and what the impact is on people spending down. Um, so again, thanking the governor and, and uh, the health department and division of the budget for their leadership on that. We're the only state in the country to pass a private pay 
model uh, that was supposed to go into effect April 1, 2020, and then the pandemic hit. But we're going back uh, at this uh, once we kind of get back to a sense of normalcy. So we have 1.6 million people over the age of 60 that have incomes of $50,000 or more, but more importantly, many people like me who could buy services through the network, get the assessment, uh, not worrying that somebody's trying to sell me something. And we were all barred from doing that in New York State. We're the only state in the country that does that. We're working on supporting caregivers uh, by working with T-Care, Archangels, and Caring Wire to help individuals reduce, understand their stress, reduce their stress, and connect to community-based resources. Uh, we've been working with FEMA and HCR at the state level uh, to bring in federal resources to continue um, our nutrition program uh, or access uh, community development block grant money to uh, retrofit um, or expand uh, our pandemic response in reopening things, as well as wiring all of our senior centers and other bricks and mortar facilities around the state. Um, we have launched several tech platforms with the Council of the Arts to bring uh, professional artists into people's homes. The Virtual Senior Center and Get Set Up, which again brings more programming into people's homes. We're piloting the VSC in 14 counties. With Get Set Up, we purchased 50,000 classes to begin with to again, connect people, combat social isolation, build friendships. There's also an economic opportunity under Get Set Up that we can utilize the skills and experiences of our older population to have them teach classes and get paid for it. Again, I mentioned the tech support. Uh, we have an award-winning, state award-winning and national leading animatronic pet project to combat social isolation. We're about ready to launch Pets Together, which brings live for free uh, pets to isolated uh, older adults. The pet is the mechanism for the interconnectivity. And we're really excited to do that. And then we're working with the health department, Department of Labor, OCFS, and the public and private sector to really get a handle on who's caregiving, who's caregiving in the workforce. How do we help HR departments understand their workforce and that everybody has caregivers in their workforce um, and connect them to resources. CDC put out some right. data and said, yeah. We have, about three, we, no, we have about three minutes left. Okay, then I'm gonna move into uh, next. So this is where, again, thanking Senator Gillibrand, what are we doing? I've been doing this work now for 29 years. There have been, there are great parts of the Older Americans Act and there are antiquated old parts of the Older Americans Act. We learned a lot from the pandemic and we need to move into the 21st century. Uh, many of the uh, things that are in the Old Americans Act are still stuck in 1965, frankly. Um, so uh, Becky Preeby and I are leading a national effort to rewrite the Old Americans Act, which uh, Senator Gillibrand has committed to supporting. And so we're really thrilled about that. This is kind of how we're funded now. And we have new data. So we're mostly funded at the state and the county level. The county now is putting in $315 million. That data just came out yesterday. And what I'm trying to do, she mentioned the 1.4 billion that brought in uh, an additional 85 million to our agency, the other stimulus bills, an additional 82. I wanna get to a $2.7 billion um, annual appropriation so that we can balance out and invest in the front end stuff. So we're looking to update the act, uh, respond to the issues uh, we identified during the pandemic, ensure flexibility and position us for the future. And so the 2.7 billion, this is what it would do. It would provide us a lot of flexibility, enhance rates, identify locally determined needs, a workforce investment. We cannot rely on volunteers anymore. Volunteers are always gonna be important, but we're a professional network working with healthcare providers, uh, health systems, and we need a workforce um, that responds to that so that when things like this happen, we don't lose capacity because we are um, you know, relying on people who are giving of their time. So I gave you an appendix. I just want to do this very, very quickly. Um, ageism. We have to combat this, okay? Uh, Beth talked about the longevity economy. 83% of the household wealth is held by people over the age of 50. They support 90 million jobs. Almost 50% of the tax revenue base are the number one entrepreneur group. Uh, huge tourism block, huge workforce block, huge giver to philanthropy. Uh, to, and to faith organizations, and we have to recognize their value, talk about the value, because when you value something, your interventions then become different and get out of this 200-year tradition that older adults have nothing to offer, they're a drain on resources, um, and, they, and, they, and they don't give back. 
that is just false and you can help me do that. So again, Lou, I, I wanna thank you so much because I know a lot of these conversations focus on Medicaid and healthcare and clinical care. And you've always been you know, upfront in terms of bringing in the other side of the street, which is us, where we can help each other. And you know, the project that we're working on together is a great example of, of that in Columbia County. So thank you all for your time and everything that you've done and will continue to do um, to get us back to a sense of normalcy. Wow, that's a whirlwind, Greg. And I, I knew you could fill up the time. You probably could fill up twice the time, if not three times, because NISOFA is doing so much and working on so many fronts. 25 years ago, when we were doing this program, NISOFA had great ideas, but didn't have the funding it needed to carry out these projects. So it's so gratifying to hear that the mission and the rhetoric that existed then is now being funded. Uh, and what do you attribute that to? I attribute it to um, you know, the return on investment we were able to show in Medicaid savings. So we did a deep dive into um, our waiting list a couple of years ago. And we know exactly what happens to people when they are not able to get our services. 10% go into a nursing home, 7% go into MLTC, high emergency room and hospitalization rates. And then we have a bulk of people that died awaiting service. So it's not hard to figure out what that savings is. And then if the average person stays on our programs for three to seven years, there's three to seven years worth of savings. Not to mention we had a variety of uh, balance incentive program innovations pilots that showed mm -hmm. a five to one Medicaid re uh, uh, return on investment for preventable hospital readmissions. So you know, having some of that data to be able to show the efficacy of what we do and then working with health systems where they're saying to me, where have you guys been? This is great, how do we partner? That's why yeah. this, Lou, I appreciate your invite to me every year. That's why these types of things are so important. Absolutely. And you mentioned the Columbia County Project. Our last speaker of the day, speakers, Alan Evans and Susan Vale, are going to talk a little bit about the technology and the data that's going to be gathered there and the evidence-based solutions that we hope to bring to the community starting in Columbia County and then hopefully branching it out. So, Greg, thank you as always. This has been tremendous and a tremendous value to me and to all of our listeners. So thank you. You're welcome, Lou. Thanks, everybody.